No worries. No worries. Right. We'll start again. I'll do a nice intro and then we'll come in and we'll just start rolling. Right. Sharu, welcome to the podcast. Thanks Let's for having me, Andy. Thanks. And, and the reason we're doing this again, because I forgot to press record. So here we are again. Like, it's a really nice, heartfelt <laughs> intro about Sharu being here with me. And it feels somewhat forced to do that again. So just to say, Sharu is someone that I, I greatly admire. I admire her books, The Kindness Method, The Last Diet. She's become a great friend of mine over the last few years. We geek out on all things behavioral change. And it's a real pleasure to have you here with me again today. And Perfect. I am still very glad to be here. <laughs> you, you're only so glad because I, I realised quite early on that I hadn't pressed record. Had that been about an hour into it, you probably would have been a lot less glad. But anyway, we are back on track. So I wanted to just sort of take a deeper dive into your backstory, really. That's, I think, the, the idea behind this podcast in many ways is, is to find out the story behind the stories. What's led you to this place where now you're an author and I guess an influencer in the well-being space and are filled with this meaning and purpose. But how did we get there? And I think your story is really interesting because it starts very young as a child and, and your relationship with food. So I don't know if you want to start with that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, when I was younger, I was pretty concerned about how I looked. I was pretty concerned about my weight. I was pretty overweight as a child. Um, and the other kids kind of made me very aware of that. And it was it was tough in that sense. And I guess as soon as I knew about diets and things like that, I, st I started to treat my body pretty unkindly and do a bunch of stuff that I now know is not only unkind and damaging, but also wildly unhelpful when it comes to behavioral change. Um, so from a really young age, I was, uh, well, first of all, I would binge eat to kind of numb out. Mm. And then the dieting reinforced that because, of course, dieting brings about that sort of all or nothing feast or famine mentality where you're either being good or bad. And so I was um, sort of moralizing food and eating choices very early on in my life. And then the worse I felt about the way I looked, the more I wanted that kind of go away. And I had found you know, binge eating to help me do that, which of course, practically speaking, kind of made the situation worse. Um, and so it was a couple of decades, I guess, of roughly of um, really abusing myself, neglecting myself when it came to food and the way that I spoke to myself about my body and the way that I treated my body and really only associating things like exercise and self-care with my weight and I learned that from a very early age and sadly in the work that I'm doing now I've realized that that's not uncommon yeah um, and what's interesting that I think in your book you were talking about you being nine or ten when these sort of this first started to, to appear in your life which which I thought was really telling and there was a point that you almost started to talk about addiction from that like early age to food and it, it was it was it really woke me up there was a line in the book where you were talking about your relationship with food and it was almost full stop and then it said and i was just a kid and it was like this real again sort of heartfelt moment of you don't really associate those type of things with young children you assume this is an, an adult type of issue and here you were this this really young child wrestling with i can only imagine all of this stuff going through your mind your relationship with food is getting slightly out of control. There's the, you know, the kids at school that are, are particularly unkind and you're trying to manage all this and you're still a little tiny kid, you know? And I think that's that, you know, I don't know if you want to speak to that, but I just found that was, it was just, a, it felt a bit sad for you. It is sad, it is sad. When I look back on it now, it's sad. When I have people come talk to me about their kids having the same thing, it's mm. sad. It was sad also, I think that I felt, you know, think about programs like Friends, the programs we were watching when we were kids and how they painted a character like Monica, you know, um, it was all this, like, if you're, if you're overweight, you're, it's funny that you would have a boyfriend. It's funny that you would be dancing. It's funny that, you know, it's laughable that you would enjoy your life. Um, and you know, you had to be jolly all the time. It was just, it was so weird. It was so like, you had to change in order to, you had to change the size of your body in order to, to be worthy. Um, and that was just reinforced in so many places, aside from the fact that 
you know, many of us have the generations before us, especially women, you know, had we didn't know the harms of dieting either, but mm. to the same extent, but or um, placing so much importance on the way we look and controlling what we eat. But yeah, and I mean, yeah, it's it's incredibly sad. And also the fact that, that I felt like it was my, like there was something the matter with me. I think that's yeah. the saddest thing is that you kind of think there's something wrong with me because my body doesn't look the way that other kids' bodies look. And I seem to not be able to stop eating when other kids do. And that must mean I need fixing. Um, because obviously, you know, that that shift where you see a problematic habit, for example, as being a solution to something is something that didn't come about for me until I was like in my 30s, that, that reframe, let alone when you're trying to navigate all the other difficulties of being young. You just want to be like everyone else. You just want to be like the other kids. You want to dress like them. You want to move like them. You want to, you know, um, so yeah, it is, it is sad actually. Yeah, and I think you're right with all of your experience and learning, as you said, it's not until your thirties. So you can imagine wrestling through all of that period through your childhood, your teens with this thing that you can't quite get to grips with. Another thing I wanted to mention was that your, your mum's involvement and like all parents, you know, just want to do their best for, for their mm -hmm. child. And you know, I can only imagine I've got young daughters, 12 and, and 15. And, you know, it's one of these things that, you, that you, you know, you worry about a bit as a parent. One of them's a ballerina, and in, in, in the ballerina world, there's lots of issues around food, let's say. And it's something that we're conscious of, and fortunately, it doesn't seem to be any type of issue at the moment. But if it were, I don't think I'd know what to do. And I think, you know, I, I, I felt for your mum in some ways, and it was like she was trying her best, and everything that she was doing, it felt like was probably having the opposite effect. Um, you know, and again, I don't know if that's something that you, you can share. But. Absolutely. I feel for her too in that sense. You know, you're kind of damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Do you ignore your child saying that they're unhappy um, with their weight? You know, do you um, ignore the fact that they're asking for help? You know, the fact that you and I ha can have find it difficult to have conversations about something so sensitive now in 2021 with all that we've read about motivation and all that I've read about addiction makes you really feel for parents who yeah. are just trying their best with the stuff. You know, you see that your child is upset. You see that your child feels different to other children. Um, you do what you can. Right. So I feel for her as well. And I think that a lot of people didn't know the, how damaging dieting could be. Oh, listen, Andy, to this day, a lot of people yeah. don't know how damaging dieting is. Um, so yeah, I feel for her in that sense, I really do. But in the end, you know, I'm very grateful to her because my mum is incredibly strong and incredibly yeah. kind. And so I've kind of seen how those two things can go hand in hand. And I think ultimately the, the, the headline of all my work now is that kindness is yeah. strength. So I'm enormously grateful to her, but yeah, I do feel for her in that sense. And I can't tell you how many parents contact me about the same thing. Um, and it's really hard. It's, it's really hard to answer the question of, do I help them to manage their weight? Um, because you can take the focus off the weight, but that doesn't stop the fact that it's in their faces all day. It's all over Instagram. Uh, people are talking yeah. about it at school. It's in the media. And so then you think, am I bringing it? Am I making it worse by acknowledging it? Am I working, making it worse by not? It's a minefield. Yeah, it, it really is. And, you know, a question that I was going to ask you, and I think you might even find it difficult to answer, is that if you could go back and, and give your mum some advice to give to you as a young teenager, you know, what would, what would that be in your circumstance? Well, I guess it's important to say that in my particular circumstance, this is all turned into me turning it into a book. <laughs> so <laughs> it turned out fine. But I do think that um, one of the main things I would have done, both in terms of what I would have told my mum and also in terms of what I would have told my school, is to encourage all children to enjoy exercise and to find exercise and movement to be a joy in a way that suits them. Um, I only ever associated exercise and movement with weight loss 
from a very young age. And I didn't come from a particularly active family in that sense. And so we weren't out like, I don't even know what the example is right now. I don't know, kicking a ball or whatever. Yeah. Um, that wasn't the case. It was like you go to the gym, you know, you like specifically exercise for the purpose of becoming sure. fit or the purpose of managing your weight. Um, I think that's partly cultural too, if I'm perfectly honest, in my in my case. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I came to only associate movement, like movement that got your heart rate going and got you sweating and stuff with trying to change my body as opposed to making me feel better and making me feel alive and getting blood pumping through my body. So I think that's the main thing I would have done is to bring that in earlier because in later life, or later life, you know, in more, more recent stages of my life, it's become an absolute savior. And it, the fact that it helps me manage my weight is just like a happy byproduct. Yeah, and I think that's that's so true. I, I'm really passionate about this as well. I'm passionate about sport in general because I think it's just a wonderful way to learn so much about life, about failure, about success, about being dropped, about you know competition, and also about enjoyment. And you're right, and I genuinely believe, along with you, for different reasons, but now I'm glad that you've articulated those reasons because I hadn't even considered those, that every child should be given an opportunity to find a sport that they love, that they enjoy, whether that's weight training whether that's rounders whether that's football mm. whereas i think at the moment we're sort of pigeonholed into the classic big sports from you know netball for girls or football for boys and cricket whatever it is hockey or whatever the setup is but there's so much more than that you know and i think every child i do a lot of work around strength training at the moment and the amount of teenage girls specifically love it really enjoy it. it's one of the first things they've found that gives them that endorphin rush. There's a sense of achievement. I never thought I'd find that many, you know, teenage girls getting such a great experience from strength training. My girls also strength train with me and they love it. So there's all these different ways to move your body that I think we should go above and beyond. And I think that's a brilliant piece of advice and not what I expected, but exactly what you said, rather than it being something you feel you've got to do to lose weight. It's like, let's just get out and enjoy this thing and the byproduct might be that it helps you regulate your weight. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it would have helped if there was more representation that the people who were doing exercise and being good at exercise weren't necessarily slim and weren't yeah. necessarily already good at exercise and getting better at it. They were people who were enjoying exercise and had disassociated their weight from health or fitness, um, which is so important. When I was at school, it was like the kids who were good at exercise already and were fit already, they were kind of invested in. And then the rest of us were like, okay, well, this isn't for you then. Yeah, you're, um, you're sort of on the scrap heap, as it were, or you can go over yeah. there and do your own sort of stuff. Yeah, exactly. Because I think it was so outcomes based, you know, like how many goals yeah. you're scoring, whatever, yeah. as opposed to like, how good do you feel after exercising? Um, how much, you know, more pumped do you feel? How much, in my case, how much less anxiety do you have? Um, all of that stuff helps enormously and I think would have made a real dif difference to me. Yeah, I think that's, that, that's so true. Brilliant advice. I, I'm really pleased that you came up with that advice. Um, and then just stepping forward a bit into your, I guess, sort of uh, late teens, early 20s, you go off to university. And I, and I remember reading there was a point where you got super s slim, You sort of, again, to, to sort of get there. This is that ongoing battle that you're facing, but using slimming pills. Oh yeah, not just that. Um, a whole bunch of stuff I use that I tend not to share. And you know what? Um, in the reprint of the second book, I felt comfortable enough to also share that at one point I had a gastric band fitted. And I didn't right. even tell my friends. And then I, I had to have it removed because anyone who's had one fitted, well, a lot of people who've, ha who've, who've done that will tell you that it um, can have some really bad side effects. Mm. And it, it made me develop a totally different eating disorder which in the end was much worse um it made the situation worse and i did it in secret i didn't tell any of my friends again just thinking about it is just it's so sad to think that i felt like i needed to go to those lengths um and that my body deserved to be treated that way even by the time i went to university but i was just so desperate because my whole life was on on hold i was always like well then i'll enjoy my life when i eventually look like this or i look like that and you know when the first book came out I was scared um, to share all this stuff because mm. I just thought gosh I've been so mean to myself and 
I don't know, there was a real shame around it. There was a real shame to the lengths that I was prepared to go to. And now that I've learned more and I've come to terms, you know, with what I've been through and stuff, I do kind of realize, I just look at myself with such compassion. And I kind of think, gosh, what, how did it get to a stage where that's what you thought you had to do? Um, and obviously, you know, it could be the right choice for a bunch of people. But for me, it wasn't. It was the case that I was continuously focused on how I looked and not how yeah. I was eating and how I was treating my body. And frankly, whatever, you know, if you're abusing diet pills, if you're taking a bunch of the other stuff, again, I'm always careful because I don't know who's kind of listening. And yeah. um, I know that back in the day, if I had listened to a podcast when I was in the wrong mindset, in a different mindset, I would have been listening out for what helped me lose weight, regardless of how unhealthy and unkind it was. So I try to be very careful now about what I say publicly, but about what I managed to do. But if you've heard of it, I've tried it. Right. Um, uh, and it's uh, and it's you know it was really bad at one point but yeah I went to uni and I still didn't know how to, how to eat I was either on a yeah. diet or off a diet and on a diet meant barely eating anything and off a diet meant eating absolutely everything until I was um, you know I literally couldn't move so it was one or the other I hadn't learned to like actually enjoy food and I think this is one of the things that people often get wrong about people who are in the position that I was in is that they think oh if you're eating a lot or you're very overweight that you love food a lot and actually I never hated food more it was the bane of my life all I thought about yeah. all day was what I was or wasn't going to eat and whether I did or did not look good and it was absolutely horrible yeah and no, I, I can imagine how tough in some ways that would be because I think there's a you know we've discussed the sort of parallels between alcohol and and, and food and and the big there are so, so many commonalities but there's a huge difference which and why I really appreciate the work that you do is that with alcohol for example you can stop drinking you know you will survive perfectly normally in fact your life will get a squillion times better in my opinion when you don't <laughs> drink but you can't stop eating food you know you have this thing that you can't just sort of put it away and and you know forget about it and become this new person without it you constantly face with the very thing that's causing you this upset and that pain and to hear you say that you know it was food that you sort of hated in the end but you can't mm -hmm. get away from it you have to consume it there's all these different ideas and concepts to try and manage it and here you are battling that there's in insecurities of being away from home at university meeting new people and how you know you're supposed to look yeah, it's just such a minefield, isn't it, of, of you know, psychological just mess with your head when you're just trying to get by and, and, and like you say, just sort of fit in and, and be normal. Yeah. And, and one thing I wanted to, to, to touch on that is the sense that in many ways, for example, dieting pills or even the gastric band can sort of get you to that place where you've lost weight in theory. Again, I'm, I'm clearly mm -hmm. not an expert on this stuff, but I think we'll get to this in a minute. But there's a sense that maybe you lose the opportunity for the learning that you sort of need to get. It's like that fast track to the end result. But somewhere in that middle, as horrible and as hard as it is, the learning needs to take place so that you can make this a permanent change. Absolutely. And all it does is reinforce that what you're trying to do is change the way you look, not change mm. the way you behave. Yeah. I mean, knowing... Um, yeah, uh, being able to lose weight is, requires a very different set of skills to being able to enjoy food and manage a weight that you're happy with. It's a totally different thing. Um, and also what it does is when you take these like rash, like with operations or procedures or whatever, again, they work for some people. I don't want to rule anything out, you know, take a yeah. pinch of salt. This is just my experience. But what they do is reinforce this idea that there was something wrong, I think. Yeah. Whereas it transpired that eating the way that I was eating was serving a purpose for me. So when I could no longer do that, when I had stopped my physical capacity to do that, what I was, what I had done is kind of, kind of get rid of a friend mm. and not acknowledge that it had been a friend. Um, and then I was left without my friend and I was left without my coping strategies and the thing that I did when I felt sad. So when mm. I felt sad, I didn't know what to do. This is um, really interesting. This is like where um, Gabor Mate has that saying, doesn't he? Not why the problem, why the pain. And it's not, the same thing. No. As, 
not why, why the, the problem, addiction, yeah. Why the, why, why the pain? Well, like, what is it underneath that, that, that is causing you to consume the food or, or drink the alcohol, whatever it is? It's what, what lies beneath is, and, and that's what you've just articulated perfectly there. You've sort of, by fast-tracking the, the issue through the gastric bands or whatever it is, you're removing that, that coping mechanism. And if you haven't got, you know, a, a, another set of skills, then all of a sudden there's a real gaping void. It's almost worse than the situation you're in already. Yeah, and you're also not having compassion for the fact that there was a reason why you found it so difficult to change in yeah. the first place. It's because you had a relationship with the substance because it was doing something for you. Whether or not yeah. you like it, it was your mate. So you just cutting your mate out and saying, well, now the negatives have outweighed the positives, off you go, leaves you without your mate and mm. leaves you thinking that you were stupid to have done that in the first place, in my case. Mm. Um, whereas I wasn't, I was, I needed something and I found it somewhere and then it became a habit. And I think it's that behaving perfectly normally for a human being that's in some kind of emotional pain will look and will search and will seek to find something to soothe that pain. Again, it could be in a glass of wine or it could be in food or a whole host of different things. But when we're in pain, it's a perfectly natural reaction to want to soothe that pain. And, and many things can soothe the pain or appear to soothe the pain that end up becoming the issue itself and, and it's just really interesting to see that unfold in your story and what I think is interesting next as we progress is how and you touched on it earlier the very thing that is causing you all this pain in your life right this thing that's like filled your mind since you were a child at the first opportunity rather than sort of running away from it you're like I know what I do I'm gonna study addiction is that what you talk was it uh, you know see you were drawn back in and, and I've, I see that all the time. Your sort of biggest, you know, mess in life becomes your message or, you know, whatever it is. And you're drawn right back into this very thing that had, had troubled you all these years. And I can't remember, did you study addiction at university? I studied psychology. I studied psychology, uh, psychosocial. And then I did a master's in psychology. And I, um, my first placement was in an NHS addiction service. Um, and yeah, from the first day that I got in there, that was it. I just knew what I was going to do. That was it. I'd never had an experience like that before. I remember telling them, even though I wasn't getting paid for the placement and I had to do a bunch of other jobs to pay my bills and stuff, I said to them, I want you to treat me like a proper staff member from the first day. I want to, I want to learn everything. I was obsessed. Um, I just couldn't believe how people were transforming their lives. I couldn't believe that these simple tools that I could have been using my whole life when I was off paying hundreds of pounds to do this or getting injections or buying pills or whatever else, that it could come down to these this like motivational knowledge that I never had. And as soon as I discovered it, I just thought, everyone has to know. I have to learn everything about it. Everyone has to know. These people are angels. This is amazing. This is where I'm meant to be. Oh, it's just so wonderful to, to, to just literally you just light up when you're talking about that stuff. And this is what this podcast is about, how people find their meaning and purpose. So in your example, do you think there was that aha moment you just sort of described? But do you think you were sort of drawn towards that? Or was it just pure luck that you happened to take that placement in an addiction? Uh, was it Amy's place? Was that where you No, started? it was um, Central Northwest London Trust in Wilsden. It was a place called the Junction Service. To be honest with you, Andy, I remember writing a really heartfelt email to the clinical psychologist there, asking if I could work there. But I think if I'm honest, it was one of the only placements I was offered. Um, right. It wasn't until I got in, I wasn't a wildly academic person. I was always a worker. I always just did, I just learned enough to get in. You know, that yeah. was my whole thing. I wasn't like a lover of learning. And even now, I always, the learning that I do is kind of reverse engineered. You know, I'll see a pattern of behavior in people or in a workplace or something, and then I'll go and find the evidence base behind it. Um, so as soon as I was in and actually doing assessments and doing like working with people, that's what got the hook for me. I was like, wow, I, I get to connect with like eight or nine people all day. Um, and get to hand over all these amazing tools to them and empower them with these tools. Um, yeah, it was blowing my mind, absolutely blowing my mind. And I loved it, I used to say that. And by the way, we're not talking about the most glamorous of settings. Yeah, this wasn't I'm, like, I'm there were a lot of people who didn't want to do, I mean, it was 
it was a uh, yeah it's not a sexy place andy i'll tell you that it's not a sexy place but again what a wonderful <laughs> place to learn and you know again part of this podcast really is how people very often stumble upon you know meaning and purpose through many sort of twists and turns and here you are maybe the only placement maybe it was in the stars who knows you turn up and you go wow this is amazing your whole like demeanor just changed you just i've got to do something about this i've got to show all these people it's not the most beautiful surroundings but there's this opportunity to help people make real transformation in their life and that in itself is just i i know from my own experience it's so incredibly powerful so you, you spend some time there you, you start to learn and, and then what what happens then i just um it just became very clear that I was staying there and that I was moving into a key work role. And I very quickly um, immersed myself in every opportunity I could possibly have, whether it was sitting on reception so that I could make people tea to sitting in on um, like multidisciplinary meetings that I just wanted to absorb all the information in the world. And I went straight into a job as a key worker for an, for Turning Point, just leading substance misuse um organization and then i i became the criminal justice lead in waltham forest for turning point and so i was responsible for overseeing people who were on drug rehabilitation requirements and helping people and these were people by the way who didn't necessarily want treatment they um they had to have treat court ordered treatment so that was a real baptism of fire yeah. you know it's one thing preaching to the converted it's one thing helping someone who's come in and said that they want help quite another to help someone to find purpose and to not want to use necessarily problematically when um, it's causing other problems in their lives, but they haven't acknowledged that they necessarily want to change their behaviors. So that was extraordinary and I loved it. And then I got um, headhunted. I started working for a consultancy and working with the Ministry of Justice and the NHS. And at this point I was helping to actually write programs that went into substance misuse services and yeah. all of this happened so quickly, Andy, like whenever, you know, I used to have a sort of imposter syndrome about how quickly I moved up the ranks and just started. Um, but then I kind of thought to myself, I worked so hard for yeah. so many hours, like the hours that I racked up that I didn't have to because I adored it. And the amount of knowledge that I insisted on, um, on absorbing because I was just obsessed. I was obsessed yeah. with it. So anyway, I started and then I was moving around the country with a suitcase and a projector. I was going places that I, I never thought my work would ever take me and training huge staff teams, NHS staff teams with huge case loads to help to motivate their most resistant clients um, in addiction. And can I and ask actually, what would you use? Because it's such an interesting topic. You've got these people that have been told off, basically. They've been told off by the judge, right? You've got to go and get yeah. yourself some rehab, right? Which have got to be the, many of them, the most unmotivated probably people on the planet going, well, sod you, but all right, I've got to tick this box. And they land, you know, with you. What sort of, you know, if there were some takeaways from that experience or a, a techniques that you'd use, um, if you can share I any of those. I took the focus off people's behaviors and put it on mm. what kind of life do you want to have? Brilliant. Like, what kind of life do you want to have? How do you want to feel in five years? How do you want to feel in 10 years? What sort of life do you want to build? What sort of life excites you? And then we worked backwards from there and created habits that move them towards that place. You, you kind of shift away from where you don't want to be and what's wrong and get people excited about where they do want to be. Um, and what right. would give them a sense of purpose. And so it was, it was about identifying people's values and then creating goals that aligned with those values in the direction that they want to go in. And it was about giving people the permission to dream really and get excited, particularly when you were working with, with people who had legitimately not seen that happen. They'd not seen people mm -hmm. who looked like them and had the background that they had achieve the things that they wanted to achieve. So a big part of my job was helping people to truly believe that they were worthy and capable of getting to where they wanted to be. And we never talked about drugs. I never talked about drugs. Um, Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, it was a completely different approach, which I think is, is, is the genius on, on your part in the, the sense that they were probably expecting that sort of confrontation of, again, you've been a naughty boy and you've got to stop doing this thing. And all of a sudden they're talking about 
their aspirations. They may be dreaming into the future of what they'd look like their life to look about, connecting with their values and using that as their sort of north star, as it were, to betterment or a better self. And, and like you've just described there, you didn't even have to talk about the problem that they're in for. It's more of a, uh, an inspirational um, relationship. I just think that's a really beautiful way, again, to deal with that problem. I was sitting there racking my brains going, how are we going to deal with that one? And, and mm. you've just articulated it perfectly. And I think that's what's given you this lovely, rich experience, isn't it? Where you've thrown yourself into this thing, you're absorbing all this learning from all these different types of scenarios, which again is going to influence your work down the line. And just before we move on even to the next um, part of your career, is the sort of kindness method, that approach starting to sort of formulate in your mind at this stage, or is that something that sort of imbued what you were doing anyway? Yeah, no, the kindness method really was, um, practically speaking, in the book, is a set of exercises which have been, which is, which I've adapted, but have ultimately been being used in, in substance misuse services for ages. Yeah. That was my whole point, was that I just wanted to bring them to the public and be like, yeah. people in recovery know an enormous amount, and they're doing this stuff every day for free, and we're off paying for all these courses and things when all we need to do is learn to be nicer to ourselves get to know ourselves better and believe in ourselves more and the exercises that we can do and the practices we can bring into into our lives to do those things are free and they're available and let me just take the jargon out and let me make them look um useful and let me take everything that i found to be useful so as this process goes on i was really geeking out on it i was I was finding all the things that I, I actually kept like a collection of things that I found useful both and I was using them on myself I was using with with my friends with my family I was like hey look at this thing I learned at work today that helps someone yeah. to stop smoking crack and I think it's going to help me to use my phone less um you know and I just kept coming up you know looking at acceptance and commitment therapy mindfulness based relapse prevention uh old school CBT uh DBT um all that all of that kind of stuff and looking at motivational interviewing, looking at all the stuff that was helping yeah. people and just putting it all together and giving myself permission to take the bits that I found effective and ignore the bits that I didn't. And, you know, I had a boss and a mentor called, uh, well, I was, I was very lucky in that first when I was in Wilsdon, I was supervised by the chair of addictions of the BPS, um, who was, I mean, just extraordinary and taught me an enormous amount in, in terms of academics. But then I was supervised by, um, a man called Ray Jenkins, um, who became my boss when I was a consultant. And he really gave me permission to do that. And so I could give permission to other people to do it without um, feeling like we were being imposters or, you know, to take what works for you, adapt it. Um, and so, yeah, the kindness method was, was me doing that and also me giving other people the permission to do it for themselves. Like even in the kindness method, I say like the bits that suit you, take them adapt them, do what you need with them. Um, I think sometimes we need permission to do that. Yeah, I, t I totally agree. And, and everything that I've done it, in, in many ways is completely similar to that. It's like, right, I'm gonna go out on this quest because just like you, have got this passion for, for the learning and I'm gonna take all the bits that sort of work for me. You know, and that literally is the filter. Does it work for me? Yes, right, I'm gonna share it. And making the assumption that hopefully we're relatively grounded in the real world and therefore the stuff that works for us might work for someone else and cut down some of the noise because there's so much information available and then you've got this you're in this i think we're both in a quite fortunate space where we can cherry pick from all the different genres without being wedded to just one you know and i think if you come through maybe research or you've you know you're part of a process of creating one style of learning you're sort of stuck in that style of learning where we've got this beautiful flexibility where we can just cherry pick the bits that work and then share it and again people can then cherry pick the bits that we've shared and take the bits that work for them and then hopefully you only need one or two things you know it's like yourself that really resonate with someone and that can be enough to spark change or, or lasting behavioral change and, and that's such a beautiful thing and I think even the the underlying message from the kindness method let alone the tools and the techniques within it is such a simple approach isn't it it's like rather than hit yourself continually with a stick and we know that's how many people try to motivate themselves i've tried that for years most people do it's almost our default mechanism of motivation and we tell ourselves off for how naughty we've been and we berate ourselves call ourselves names it's like well actually what is way more effective and the science backs it up 
is if you treat yourself with kindness and compassion because then you don't run away from and sweep it under the carpet. There's a bit more space and empathy to face up to your failures and your imperfections. And there's the opportunity to learn. I think that's where the magic comes from. I think that's a fantastic way of putting it because I think often the mistake that people make when you throw around, around the word kindness is that they think that you're telling them to do whatever they want whenever they want um, all day. People say to me, what if I think kindness are just sitting on the couch drinking wine all day? <laughs> you know, and I often say, like, if you want a definition for kindness, it's, it's very simple. Just, just tell me what you tell the person you love most to do. Because very often when it comes to our loved ones, treating them with kindness is supporting them to believe in their capacity to do difficult things, to get through the discomfort of change in order to achieve and feel worthy and capable of achieving their long-term most meaningful goals, as opposed to the shorter fixes. And yeah, I agree with you. I think the other thing is, right, the tough love thing and the beat yourself with a stick thing. I, I think it can work. Oh, yeah. It can work. I think the issue becomes then for me is that you don't improve any other part of your life. Mm. You haven't developed any transferable skills. Um, you've just managed not to do that one thing. And I also find in terms of long term change, things that take a long, long, long time to, to change fundamentally, like eating habits when you've eaten your whole life. Um, in my case, tough love will get you going, but it's uh, compassion and curiosity and self-care that will keep you going. I think that in itself is worth the podcast listen alone. I think that's just so true, isn't it? The long-term change, I think, only really comes from compassion. That acceptance that we're not perfect, that things will go wrong, which opens that space for learning. I was trying to hit yourself with a stick can get you going. Uh, admittedly, there's definitely a place for it, but lasting change, I think, comes from compassion alone. I think that was really beautifully said. And then on that note, so here you are, we've just sort of started to touch on this kindness method that's building in the background. You've got these wonderful mentors, these wise guides that have appeared when the student is ready. And I think we hear that in so many people's story that these, these mentors just sort of come to us very often at the right time. And you're starting to build your own momentum now. And then did you branch out into your own practice. I, I remember you did you work at Amy's place as well. Yeah, well, so the workshops I was, I was working in addiction and I was being invited okay. to these super cool um, meetings uh, to, around drug policy and um, a government advice on drug policy. And I met someone who worked for the Amy Winehouse Foundation and um, he was a man called Dominic Ruffy and he is a man called Dominic Ruffy. And he was very cool and we became friends and we started talking and he said, look, there's this recovery house for young women opening up. It happened to be down uh, near where I live. And I said to him, like, I want to get involved. So I started as a volunteer and now I guess four years on, I still work there. It's the best bit of my week, best bit of my life, wow. I'd say. I'm obsessed. Um, and so the young women are there for two years. I have coaching sessions with them. I'm technically called a relapse prevention coach, but to be honest with you, the last thing we ever talk about is relapse or using or anything like that. And just like I said before, we're talking about like, how do you want to live? How do you see your life? What, you know, what would make you happy? What would make you feel fulfilled? Um, and those are the conversations we have around coping strategies, et cetera. So that, that happened, but what also happened around about the same time is the workshops that I was delivering for NHS staff with the blessing of my boss at the time, I said to him, look, I want to go to the school of life um, in, Blooms in Bloomsbury. Cause I was- oh, yeah, a, I haven't been there yet. I want to check I that out. Fan. I was a fan of the school of life in Bloomsbury. And, and I said, look, because at this point, um, a lot of the exercises were already helping me personally and I was starting to already adapt them and really move away from the substance misuse space and move into the well-being and personal development space in my own life because I was a consultant with him I was still technically self-employed you know and I said to him look I think I want to do this and I want to attach my own story to it because I think that that puts forward a compelling case and I want to move this around and do my own thing a little bit so I went to the school of life and I pitched this course um, this one day workshop and I said to them you don't need to pay me or anything I just want to have a go I just want to sort of have a beta version of this go out there yeah. and it sold out 
Even the first wow. ones sold out. They were quite smart in that they put it on the third week of January, which I've since realized is my most popular week. I, see. Um, <laughs> I guess it yeah, would be, yeah. As you can imagine. Um, so it sold out and then I did it a couple more times and it sold out and I became, um, I, I was asked to become a faculty member and then I was asked to be part of their new B2B team and it all kind of spiraled from there. And of course, my boss was just super happy for me because although so much of this work had been inspired by what I'd learned through him, through Public Health England, through everything else, I think everyone could see that it was my story that was bringing it to life because I was using yeah. it every day. Um, and just thinking about him makes me so happy. He was, he's been such a wonderful influence on my life. Anyway, so the School of Life was happening and it was going really well. And then um, a journalist called Marisa Bate, who um, we, we had a mutual friend. We, we have a mutual friend, but we had never been close or anything. And she just contacted me and said, I, I hear you're working at the School of Life. Do you think you could help me? Um, because I'm drinking in a way that I'm not happy with and I don't want to stop drinking, but I don't think I'm, I want to go to AA and I really want to learn how to drink differently. And I had never helped anyone to drink differently because obviously working in services, we're talking about emergency situations, right? People need to stop mm. or people believe that they need to stop drinking and the priority is given to abstinence, understandably so by the time that people get to that point. Um, but then I thought to myself, right, well, aside from the fact that um, uh, drink is mind altering and you know, in a way that, that food isn't initially or behavior altering, let's say, um, let's just imagine that she had had to keep drinking the way I have to keep eating. Couldn't we just sit and talk about why why she's drinking, under what circumstances she wants to drink, um, what purpose it's serving? And I just asked her all the same questions that I'd had to ask myself around food and that were helping me transform my eating habits. Long story short, she wrote an article about it and how much I had helped her. And that article did very well. And I woke up one morning and I had more emails than I knew than I'd ever received in one go in my life. Yeah. And then quite, quite literally overnight, I got a therapy room and had a waiting list. And I got contacted by a book agent who I've got to admit, initially I kind of ignored because I thought it was spam. I didn't really believe anyone thought I could write a book. <sighs> Yeah. Um, and then that said, I'd kind of thought about a proposal before because I knew there was a book in it. Yeah. Um, and I had something, but I just never really believed that it would come to fruition, you know? Anyway, um, we wrote a proposal together. It went to a five publisher auction. And then the rest is history. It became the kindness method. Yeah. And it's so exciting to, to hear that story unfold. And, and again, this is sort of this journey towards our. Arate is this ancient Greek word that I love, which is about meaning and purpose and fulfillment of your potential. But there's so many twists and turns. There was that Marcia came to you to help her. She wrote an article. Suddenly it gets picked up and that was a huge article. I remember at the time, then the publishing deal comes along, the agent with uh, Pam McMillan Bluebird, who happened to be the same publisher as ourselves and the wonderful Carol Tonkinson, which is super cool. And that's how we met. So then fast forward, you've got your book, coming out we've got our first book the 28 day alcohol free challenge coming out we find ourselves in this sort of posh london hotel a showcase for bluebird and in the room with us as part of this i guess stable of well-being experts are the likes of joe wicks was in that group russell brand who wasn't there that night it was on a previous night annabelle carmen are all in this group and there's you and i looking at each other going what are we doing here how did well, we get we're into doing this it. room? I remember I was so <laughs> grateful you were there because we were both in the corner being like, okay, be cool, be cool, be cool. What the hell is going yeah. on? How has this happened? Be cool, be cool. And I ate, I remember being the only one who was eating all the sushi. I was like, why That's are all right. these famous people too cool to eat all these snacks? <laughs> There's so many snacks here. Drinking wine, eating sushi. I was living my best life. We launched into the food. That's me when I'm nervous. Again, it's like, because I don't drink alcohol, I'll go to the food. It just gives me something to do. And, and there's you and I just hanging out, like scoffing stuff and yeah. coughing, just looking around, going, oh my God, there's Joe Wicks. And I think Ruri was with me at the time and he was off doing his usual, like, hello to everyone. He loves all doing that stuff. And me and you just sort of saddled up to each other and went, how's it going? This is pretty cool, isn't it? And then we just sort of sat there <laughs> and like almost amazed and then we had to give a little uh, a little talk in front of everyone that was one of the first times i ever spoke in public i was absolutely petrified um and it sort of went okay and then you know we've sort of been hanging out 
ever since. And it's been so beautiful to see that book, you know, take off, and which has led to your second book, The Last Diet. We'll get to that in a second. But even at that point, you must have felt a little bit like a fish out of water in many ways. Did you feel that all of a sudden you were just sort of pushed into the to the limelight? And what were the sort of challenges that that suddenly, you know, brought up in your life? Yeah, I was terrified. I was absolutely mm. terrified for ages. I was terrified then. I was terrified when the book came out. I thought I was going to get trolled. I thought everyone would think the book was rubbish. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. At that point, I hadn't even written the whole book, I don't think. Had you? I don't remember. But I was certainly like, I was basically going to bed either thinking, what the, what the hell am I doing? Who do I think I am writing a book? Or I was thinking every now and then I think, oh, I think I might be a genius. That's quite good. <laughs> I'll just read that. Yeah, that was quite that. good. But there was no in between. There was no in between. And I was petrified, absolutely petrified. And funnily enough, now, like on a day to day basis, I'll have little, you know, you have little fires to put out here and there and you don't think anything of it. Or like now, for example, um, doing this podcast, for example, you know, you don't prepare. Once you know what you're talking about, you prepare by being chilled and and exercising and having a good morning and maybe meditating or whatever. You don't prepare by like thinking verbatim, what am I gonna say to Andy today? But back yeah. in the day, and by back in the day, I mean three years ago, I would have, I would have scripted this, Andy. You know, yeah. I was terrified. I was terrified of everything. My, my agent and Carol and Jess Duffy, who you know too, like helped me enormously. And now when I look back, I realize that it's so textbook because now I speak to some people who are actually somebody recently uh, one of the girls I worked with at Amy's place, I wouldn't normally say, but she's acknowledged it in her book, is a woman, is a girl, is a woman called Melissa Rice, um, who's written a book called Sobering, um, and it's brilliant. And she and I had a discussion, and she was talking to me about the things that she was apprehensive about writing a book. And I remember thinking, oh, I remember that. I yeah, remember I've been that. Here. It's your private life, too. You know, yeah. on the one hand, you're thinking, are people going to think I'm not clever enough? That's one thing on its own. Um, or have I not done enough hours? Or, you know, all the imposter syndrome stuff. And then on the other hand, I was thinking, all these people are going to know about my private life. Yeah. They're going to know about my insecurities. They're going to know about the things I've struggled with. And yet, if I keep that out, I'm going to know that there's a lack of authenticity. Exactly. Um, so I was just terrified. But in the end, um, yeah, turned out fine. You got that. <laughs> It did, and it's it's really important that, that we share this, I think, even on the, the podcast, because there's that assumption, right? People sort of see the end result. They see you now looking on fab and with two books and go, oh, maybe there's an assumption that it just comes naturally to Sheru. She just, you know, opens the, the laptop and then, da-da, 60,000 words later, there's a book. And there's no fear because she's a f amazing and fabulous. And the truth is, just like everyone else, it's like, <clears throat> Oh my God, who's going to want to read this book? I can't write. I'm dyslexic. I left school at 16. No one's going to care. And I think it's really important to get that across because it takes a ton of courage and Shiru, to, to step out and be vulnerable and to share your story and actually put something on the page. And I think that's a really important message to share with everyone. This stuff doesn't come easy, even though you're drawn to it. And there's this lovely meaning and purpose that's this sort of arrow now that's guiding you in many ways. There are a million battles to be won. And overcome to, 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 to be where you are now, to get into a place where you're genuinely helping many, many people at the moment by sharing your story. So I just, I wanted to thank you for that because it, it does take a ton of courage. Thank you, uh, thank you. And then just on that note, so the Kindness Method comes out, it's a, a big success, oh, and, and it's one of the coolest things I've ever seen with the Kindness Method. I think you sent me the photo, but was it, um, what's his name, is it Leslie Graham? Why am I Kelsey thinking Leslie Grammer, Graham? Frasier. Kelsey Gra Leslie Graham. I think he, he was Dirty Den in EastEnders. Where am I going with Leslie Graham? Kelsey Grammer from um, the right. huge Frasier. Sitcom. He was holding the book. Holding the book. You know when you just see like a sort of someone who's a mega star, you know, really, in, in like A-list type celebrity holding your book. I just thought that was the coolest thing ever. How did that come about? One of my mates was... Uh... Um, he's a photographer and he was photographing him and I'm obsessed with Frasier and by that point I was getting a lot more savvy about like you know like drop your book there drop your book there get someone <laughs> here like basically just leaving it anywhere 
And I just said, like, if there's any chance. And then he sent it to me. He sent me a picture of Kelsey Glamour, Glamour holding my book. And I was in Pret in Shoreditch. And I screamed as though I was on fire. Like, people were scared yeah. how much I screamed. But then I went straight to Holborn and, and asked them to blow it up as big as they could. And I had it blown up so big that no cab, even like an Uber XL, could fit it. It was bigger than <laughs> my life. And I had it up in my flat. And it terrified me every time I got up in the middle of the night to go to the loo, if I'm honest. Um, and yeah, that that was huge. And you know what was actually, you know what was a big, really big deal for me is the Delicious Ella podcast. I went on the Delicious Ella podcast um, and it was the most downloaded episode she'd done. And wow. it wasn't until that point, to be perfectly honest with you, it wasn't until that point that I thought I'm onto something. Even though the book was out, even though it was in foils and everything else, I, when I would go in, it wouldn't quite, I couldn't quite internalize it. It was too much. Yeah. It was like looking at the sun. And I was afraid that if I really believed it, I'd be like a dickhead. So I yeah. just kind of wasn't sure where to put it. Um, and then, and I, I don't know, I didn't know where to put it. And I kept beating myself, not beating myself up, but kind of like getting disappointed about the fact that I wasn't really internalizing my success. And then when I got yeah. that email from her, I was like, well, you know what you're doing. So if you think I know what I'm doing, um, and yeah, and I remember not having to to prepare for that podcast, and after that, thinking, all right, Sheru, you got it. You got to be your. You got to be yourself more. Yeah. Well, it was it was more the case that I was so trying to be like what I thought people wanted to yeah. see. Yeah. Like all the time, like people want to see someone who does this. People want to see someone who does that. And then I started saying things like, you know, I'd happily eat chicken nuggets on the way back from yoga class. And that's just who I am and just letting myself be who I was. And then people really embraced me. And it also meant that I wasn't worried all the time about being an imposter because I genuinely wasn't um, pretending anything. And mm-hmm. at that point, I was working so much on the imposter syndrome, too. And then I won that award at the House of Lords, which and I did. a, I actually did a, a speech where I said I, I deserve this award. <laughs> and I had to get over the fact that I felt that uh, felt cons- conceited or arrogant I kind of thought I do deserve this award I've worked really 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 hard um and I want other people to say that they deserve stuff when they get it and I want us to not find it so hard to sit in the discomfort of being happy and liking ourselves um and so everything started coming together but I think the reason I'm mentioning these things is because I think a lot of people put themselves under pressure to have the response they think they're supposed to have to success or the response they think they're meant to have when there are these milestones and it'll find you it'll find you in the moments that mean something to you specifically and for me that was when a person with this extraordinary platform had reached out to me when I had like a thousand followers um and said I saw your book and I and I would love to interview you and it happened for me when I was surrounded by all these powerful women um and I won an award and I could I could stand up and say, I deserve this. Um, and those were moments that resonated with me. Um, and you know, when the girls at Amy's place told me that they'd read my book or dedicating it to them. And like, I think everyone kind of has to find their own way um, of internalizing success. Whereas I thought that that, you know, the night that we were at the press thing, I yeah. didn't feel. It was amazing, don't get me wrong. Yeah, it was very I'm cool. totally with you. I didn't feel like I would deserve to be there. No, I, I totally agree. It was a bit like, oh, this is not for me. This is for other successful people that write books yeah. and stuff. But completely, you know, denying the fact that we were both there with our own books. But it's funny, isn't it? It takes a bit of yeah. time. It's, again, it's interesting to hear that in your story. And, and this is the sort of battles that you face on this journey, I guess, to your sort of meaning and purpose and all these things in life that, you know, one door opens and there's a giant, great big mountain behind it even uh, you know the door of success in many ways as the book gets launched then you've got to deal with the fact that actually I've, I've got to become me again and I've got to get over the whole scripted thing and just let it flow and then I think in that space you really start to connect with people then because people can sort of feel that truth you know coming through not only have you got this wonderful book that's sort of buoying that that authentic self you're now showing up as you and I think that's why you're going from success to, to success and of course, then the second book comes out, and, and which is the last diet. I'm just going to ask in case I forget: is there a third book in in the the making? Oh, yes. Yeah. Two for now, 
two for now. And then the last diet, just to quickly touch on that, because it's it's a really powerful book as well. And it really builds on a lot of the learning from the kindness method, but now it focuses on your original story, which is super, super powerful. And we didn't mention that I think you, you lost around eight stone in, in the end, in, at one point, from, from one point in your life. I mean, it's, it's pretty yes. amazing. And I think blending that beautiful experience that you've got and still have in and around addiction, for example, as well as all the wonderful tools and techniques that you've gathered, plus your authentic story, which you're really courageous to share, I think it culminates in this brilliant book, which is really different. You don't talk about food or specific diets. It's not about that at all. It's about the sort of psychology of of change. I think it's, it's, it's a really beautiful book. I don't know if you just want to just give us a, the quick sort of headline oh. of what the book's about yeah. for anyone listening. You know what, Andy? Yes, I did lose an exceptional amount of weight. Um, but so often I try... Whilst I appreciate that we're selling books and, you know, people, the diet industry is massive and I put diet on the front of the book and I knew what I was doing, you know, but it's so much more about not doing the stuff that we're told to do to lose weight in order to manage our weight. It's an unlearning process. It's yeah. essentially saying not only have the diets been damaging, they've caused, if you're like me, they've caused you to put on an enormous amount of weight that you otherwise wouldn't have put on. Yeah. Um, so it's to help people restore themselves to the common sense that they would give their kids. You know, like for example, we all this nutritional information from diets had had me thinking that if I ate a banana, it was the same as if I had a, a piece of pizza because it was, you know, the because I was counting carbs. Yeah. I know full well that if there's a kid in front of me and they ask me, hey, is this banana better for me than a than a slice of pizza? I'd be like, well, yeah, of course it is. Yeah. You know, in the same way, I'd say, enjoy the pizza. I wouldn't say don't touch the pizza or else the kid's going to start thinking, oh, when's the next time I'm going to get, get my hands yeah. on pizza, you know? So I think it was just the process of, of, uh, of sharing um, that I had learned that by, by unlearning the dieting stuff, by disassociating my weight from my worth, by disassociating exercise from weight loss, I actually managed to lose a lot of weight and start to recover from an eating disorder and there will be people who recover from eating disorders and gain weight as a result yeah. um and so it was really just saying if your story's like mine and dieting has caused you to binge eat and end up at a weight that you don't feel right at then let me help you unlearn that and let me help you feel empowered the way that i've empowered myself and you know weight will fluctuate throughout our lives my weight has fluctuated during the pandemic, not because I'm not kind to myself, not because I don't practice what I preach, but because I used to walk around all across London all day. And invariably that's gonna have a practical yeah. impact on things, right? But the fact is, the important thing is that my weight will never again fluctuate to that degree. Um, because for me, the moments where I was very, very overweight or indeed my weight was fluctuate or very underweight in my case, and I know that's different for every person, it was indicative of the fact that I was not enjoying food, that I was neglecting myself um, and that I had this all or nothing mentality that wasn't serving me. So the last diet, and I'm really glad it came after the kindness method because it's much more personal. Yeah. Um, and I all that freak out stuff that I, t I, I told you about before, I can't even imagine what level that would have got to if I hadn't written a book yet by the time I had last time. <laughs> I mean, I would have, yeah, I would have really, yeah. really struggled. Um, but by the time The Last Diet came out, I had had so many dis discussions about, about weight with people as a result of the kindness method, because so many people had bought the kindness method to change their eating habits, that I knew exactly what I was gonna write. The, kind of, the Last Diet was a totally different process. And also because, you know, you, you can read all the books in the world, there is nothing like having lived it yourself. There just isn't, it's just, there isn't. And people say that to me all the time. I'm by no means the most qualified person. I'm by no means the most academic person, but people speak to me and they don't need proof that I've been through this. You know, they can yeah. tell. And the people who relate to me know exactly how my mind works and I know exactly how their mind works. And there's something extraordinary about realizing that you're not an exception, especially when you've gone your whole life thinking there's something like uniquely wrong with you. And then you get to speak to thousands of people now who are like, no, I've got the same thing. That's exactly what I had. You obviously really get it. That has been an absolute, the biggest gift of the last diet. Yeah, and that is such a, a beautiful point to make because that's it, isn't it? Our greatest struggle 
the thing that haunts us, the thing that you know held us back, the thing that we thought was only us and we were broken around, can very often become your superpower. And I think that's exactly the case for you. Not only have you got all the wonderful technical knowledge and understanding, you've that lived experience. That is so powerful. You know, I want to learn from you because you've been there, you've seen it and you've done it and now you can articulate it in such a way that's got all that gravitas of the science and the subjective experience and that lived experience. That like bundled together is so powerful and I think that's what gives, again, the last diet so much power. And just one thing I wanted to say as well, and, and you hit the nail on the head there, it's not about the weight. Even though I, I, I mentioned it there and I almost regret mentioning it because I don't think we need to talk about no, that. No, I think no, you're no. right. I think it's 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 more about the fact that you can have a, a good relationship with food. And I, and I think whether the weight fluctuates around that is, is, is fine. It's more about getting into that place where there's a healthy relationship with food. And I think that's really powerful. And I think that's the case with everything. Because ultimately what you've, what you've done in that process, you've soothed the pain uh, as part of that process, the underlying, and whether that's with different tools and techniques, whether that's with exercise, whether that's with love or whatever it is, that yearning underneath by necessity has to be dealt with and, and hopefully fixed in many ways, which then allows that healthy relationship to reappear with the food or with the drink. And I think that's ultimately what we're doing all the time. And we're out there trying to inspire people, really. I think that's the backbone to our work in many ways, isn't it? It's to try and help people have this understanding of what lies beneath through their values, through their future self, so that they can start to do that work and actually soothe the way that pain in healthy ways. And then that gives them the opportunity then to deal with the perceived problem in, in, in a new way, which I think is really beautiful. Um, sure, I'm, I'm conscious of your, your time because we've, we've sort of run over, but I could talk to you all day, so we'll definitely get you back on because I'd like to deep dive specifically into the to last diet because it's, it's a whole topic I think that we should explore in, in more depth. And just to wrap it up there, I think what's really important again about your story, your, your march towards meaning and purpose, as I said, I think in many ways that your hardest struggles become your greatest gift. So on that note, and because we're both authors, and I should have tipped you off about this before. Is there Go a on. book outside outside of mine and yours that you would recommend? I'm such a bookworm. One book that, that it could be a fiction book, could be non-fiction that you've enjoyed or that's inspired you. In the realm of hungry ghosts. Oh, look Gabo at that, Mate. Gabo Mate. I was writing about that just this morning. Funny enough, yeah. brilliant book. I I, I'd highly book. recommend that to In everyone. The realm of hungry ghosts. It's about addiction, as you know and his experience of working in addiction, and I think it's a wonderful book. Fab. And Sharu, where can we find out more about you? What are you up to right now? I am up to all sorts. I do coaching and interviews and programs and corporate work. I do a lot of corporate workshops and go into workplaces and like help people to change habits and become more productive and optimize their productivity. So uh, you can find me at Sharuizadi uk. To be honest with you, I always say this, Andy, but with a name like mine, just put Sheru into Google. Even if I hadn't written, even if I hadn't written a book, and I yes. had just once made a YouTube video, it would be the first thing that came up anyway. So just put my first name into Google, um, it um, so because true. it's a made-up name. So thanks, parents. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know at the time, did you? It's just this beautiful thing, Sheru. It's exactly. a beautiful name. Just Google it, thanks. and you'll get everything you need. Sheru, you're an absolute superstar. We'll have you on again. Thank you so much for spending some time with us all today. My pleasure. Cool.